Let us rejoice and be glad. So, if you're noticing a little difference um, behind me, they have painted our chapel. We are very grateful. It's no longer the fish tank blue. We're now something, we can't figure out what kind of color it is, but we're sure it's not the old blue. It's uh, 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 factory uh, green now. Something. Uh, yeah. We can't. You know what I mean? Well, I'll be yeah. green. It's a little brighter, which is nice. Uh-huh. It looks nice. So we finished chapter 20 last week, and which could have been the conclusion to the book. Very easily, but John kind of added a P.S., and that's what we're going to discuss today. So having said that, let's go ahead and uh, I I recognize the hearts as they appear on Facebook. I know who joined. (laughs) Hello, Miss Pat. Um, My wife will keep me up on who's joining and who's... Hello, Arlene. Thanks for joining. Thanks for joining, Pat. Good to see you guys. Um, (laughs) So let's go ahead and ask the Lord's blessing on this, and if you want to, you can go ahead and turn to John 21, or we're praying. Lord, thank you for this time we've had together. We have together, Lord. Uh, Thank you for this time that we actually had with our brother Terry, Lord. We're going to miss him from here, but we're going to be glad that he's going to be going to a different facility, and may he be a light that shines your glorious gospel, Lord. We don't don't, uh, kind of uh, let him go. We send him, Lord, in your name, Jesus. We send him like the apostles were sent back in in the book of Acts. The church gathered around, they prayed for him, and sent them out, Lord. So we send Terry out as a minister of your gospel, Lord, that you'd be with him. May he shine your light, Lord, and uh, and may many people come to you through him, Lord, through his being there and you ministering through him, Jesus. We thank you for that, Lord. Bless this time we have together uh, as we close out the book of John, Lord, how fitting it is. This would be Terry's last time here, Lord. Uh, we bless him, Lord, in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 We're going to miss you, man. <laughs> okay, let's go ahead and read the first three verses. John chapter 20, verses 1 through 3. 21. 21, verses 1 through 3. What did I say? 20. 20. <laughs> when Adam was wrong, Eve was right there. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. And in this way, he showed himself Simon Peter, Thomas, as called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. They said to him, we're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat. And that night they caught nothing. So let's discuss that just a little bit. Um, again, this is one of those very self-explanatory chapters. There's maybe one or two verses that we can go into in depth, but there's not a whole lot. This is pretty straightforward. They said, hey, it's been a while, you know, we need some income, let's go fishing. That's what they did. It was their way of life before they were called. So they're, And they call it fishing for a reason, because what they were doing out there all night long was not catching, they were fishing. And that's why it's called fishing and not catching. So I just went out there, you know, and, and it's very therapeutic. If you're upset, you know, you need to go get away, grab a fishing pole, grab some worms, and just go relax. It's what they did. They were just going out and getting away. Um, it's the, what they were good at. It was their job. It provided their income. It was the original way Peter and several others were found by Jesus when they were originally called. Back then, they were called to be disciples. Now they're going to be called to be apostles. Big difference. Um, When you're learning, you're following, you're being taught, you are a disciple. You're being disciplined, being a disciple. Okay. After that, there should be coming a time in your life, like now, when you are to be an apostle. You're going out and teaching. And so with all this knowledge we have poured into Mr. Terry here, <laughs> we're sending him out to be the Apostle Terry. On my TV, too, it was about being sent out, you know, not get up and go and be yep. sent out. You know. You're being oh, yes. sent out, yep. Yes, it was good. So then they were told, follow me. At that time when they were originally called, now they're being sent. So now their vocation is going to become their avocation. And their vocation is going to be 
apostleship, being apostles, building up the church, which is how it should be for all of us as Christians. Sometimes I think we get wrapped too much in our work and we think that's our vocation. No, if you're a Christian, you are a Christian first. That is your vocation. Everything else is an avocation afterwards. Mm -hmm. You're a Christian who happens to be a fill-in-the-blank with whatever you are. I'm a truck driver. I happen to be a truck driver, but I'm a Christian first who happens to be a truck driver. Um, verses 4 through 6, starting at verse 4. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No! And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you'll find some. So they cast, so they cast, and now they were not able to draw in because of the multitude of fish. Wow. Amazing. So you're a professional fisherman. Here comes this carpenter dude trying to teach you how to fish. It'd be like me, a truck driver, trying to tell Wall Street how to trade stocks. Wouldn't be a pretty picture. But which, which way was the boat facing? Was the boat facing north, south, east, it west? the way of the bank, wasn't it? Yeah, I, I guess uh, in a way that they could hear. Or the other side. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I don't know either. I don't know. So what difference did it make, right or left? Uh-huh. Forward or aft? Right. What? Why? Why is the, the, did Jesus say, going on the right side? I don't know. I don't know which way the boat was facing. I don't know how green the grass was when Mark said the grass was green when they sat down the 5,000 to feed, the, feed them. I don't know, but Mark made a point of saying it was green grass. Why? I don't know why these, some of these details are in there, um, but I find it interesting. Well, Jesus is just teaching us to follow him and right. to win others. That's our job above True. everything. That's true. That's what we must do. Find our yep. talent. Each one of us has one that we can use true. to do that. Remember, remember well. in, in the books of Kings, what we must do. when it talked we about must Elijah, and there was uh, a guy named Naaman the Syrian who had leprosy, mm-hmm. and there was a little Jewish girl who was a, a servant girl in his house, and which is amazing, the faith of this little girl. That her, her, you know, you could write books about her faith. She, she said, "Yeah." She said, "Oh, I wish that Naaman was back in Israel because there's a prophet there who could heal him." Wow, really? Nobody had ever been healed of leprosy before. Yet here's this little girl saying, oh, "I wish she was back there because then the prophet would heal him." That's some faith. That this little girl is incredible. She's like one of the unsung heroes of the Bible. But Naaman was told to go dip in the Jordan River seven times and he'll be cleansed. What difference did Jordan make? Why not the Mississippi River? Why not the Tigris? The Euphrates? Why the Jordan? Why the right side of the boat? Why, why, why? Why does God have us do things that seemingly are like insignificant in our lives, but then all of a sudden you see God like... Step in, and boom, things get done. Miracles happen. Fish jump into nets. Leprosy falls off. And just miracles happen when we simply obey, regardless of how silly or ridiculous the you Lord's idea might about seem. That miracle. Yeah. It's going to make a difference in their life. That way yeah. you're going to be able to reach them. If God does that for you, boy, I bet. I have a need. Would he do it for me? Well, Should. Will yep. Get right. mm-hmm. Be safer. Uh, I think God will take over. Yep. Do everything. I, I think that these little, I mean yep, these little instructions reveal sure. our inadequacy. You look at the inadequacy of Peter. Mm-hmm. You look at the mm-hmm. inadequacy of Naaman. No, Naaman couldn't heal himself. Peter could not cause those fish to jump in the net. They simply obeyed a simple instruction from the Lord. And 
all of a sudden, here it comes. Boom. So we follow him in our inadequacy and watch what he does in spite of us and our failures and our, our, our issues. Naaman got angry. He stormed off. He said, oh, why do I got to dip in this dirty river? Peter suffered from foot and mouth syndrome. In fact, the only time he took his foot out of his mouth was to put the other foot in. That was Peter. And now all of a sudden, you know, things are happening. Uh, there's change in them. Let's continue on. Let's go back to verse 7. We're going to read uh, se uh, John 21, oh, verse 7. Okay. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved, and that's John, which was the only one who was there at the cross. Um, and, and, and you kind of see Jesus defending John. Uh, Peter tries to say something. What about him, Lord? And Jesus is right there. Step in. Hey, Peter, don't worry about my boy John. He was the only one there. Of all you guys. My family wasn't there, just my mother. And my disciples weren't there, just John. So to, to me, Jesus would say they're very special to me. i got a place in my heart for them. Um, back to verse 7. Therefore, that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord! Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. And the other disciples came in the little boat. For they were not far from land, but about 200 cubits, dragging the net with fish. Then, as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. So Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Very interesting. Y'all catch what's going on here? Yeah, he'd been there a while, you know, because he had coals. Yeah. It was coals. It wasn't fire. Yeah. It was so, so now... Who's warming himself by the fire? Jesus. When just a couple chapters ago, who was it who was warming himself by the fire? Peter. While Jesus was inside on trial. Now Peter's out in the boat getting a lesson on fishing from the master. While Jesus is safe on the shore, warming himself by the fire. He had cast his net out. It was a miracle. Yep. And Jesus honored that. So he had room for him. Yes. So this is and the other disciples that were away. This is kind of a if setup. You do something for Jesus, you can be sure he's gonna do something for you. He loves us and oh yes. Because he's gonna mm -hmm. reach out and touch others. And that's what we're about. True. <coughs> so he was there warming himself by the fire, making breakfast. For, for the disciples coming on shore. Um, and, and this is, I think it's a setup for a very important scene coming up. Before you had Jesus inside being questioned, now we're going to have Peter being questioned. Yeah. Before, you know, you had Peter warming himself by the fire, now you have Jesus by the fire. It's kind of a strange twist of events. And before you had Peter fishing, he was called to be a disciple. Now you have Peter back out fishing again. And now he's going to be changed and made into an apostle. So it's a very, it's a very, very interesting setup and turn of events this chapter is. So Peter left the fish to see to see the Lord, and then the Lord didn't say, "Okay, come and eat what I prepared for you." He said, "You bring some of your own fish." Yeah. You you worked. What you worked for, you eat. Remember in the New Testament, later on, I think it was Paul teaching that if a man doesn't work, he shouldn't eat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the Lord's reinforcing that. Hey, you, you did the work. You caught the fish. Bring some of them up. Let's have some breakfast. Traditional Jewish breakfast. Fish and bread. Traditional meat what we yeah. Oh, the majority Every of times, time. he, yeah, he was visible after he had resurrected. Yeah. He was eating. Yes, he did. Yes. I think that's just amazing. He loved to eat. Yes. <laughs> Fascinating. Me too. Me too. <laughs> Let's go on. Let's read verse 11. Chapter 21, verse 11. Simon Peter went, went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. 
And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This now is the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. Very interesting. What they couldn't haul in, Peter then goes and muscles that load of fish onto the shore. Get the picture? It was They couldn't even drag it with the boat. They were having a hard time with it. Yet all of a sudden, Peter goes up there. Let me help you, boys. Um, was Peter somehow just some strong guy, or was the Lord performing yet another miracle, strengthening Peter after he gave him the fish, helping them get him on the land? Uh, there, there's probably several miracles going on in this scene that we're just not told about. Hey, this. Hey, that. Where did Jesus' fish and bread come from? Was he there kneading the bread? Did he go out and catch the fish? Or was the appearance of bread, fish, and a fire a miracle by the Lord? So many little details here. Um, what's interesting also is, before we get into the meat of this passage, and we're going to spend a minute here, is 153 fish. People and scholars have tried to figure out forever what that number 153 means. Personally, I honestly think it genuinely has no meaning except for, for the people at the time. They might have understood that, wow, that was a huge haul of fish. Maybe just, yeah, so many. Yeah, yeah. we usually catch like maybe 20 or 30 every time we throw our net out. But they took in 153? Wow. So that's kind of like, it's not a fish story. That's actual true. It's a true story. They caught 153. Um, and incidentally, uh, in cave number 11 in Qumran uh, of the Dead Sea Scroll Caves, in cave number 11, they found the Psalms. Okay. In that book of Psalms, there were actually 153. Three actual written Psalms by David did not make it into the 150 we have in our book of Psalms. So there were 153. Is that the significance of the number? I'm not sure. Um, but I, again, I don't want to get hung up on, on the little details and miss the big picture. This is the big picture. You're driving along, and you say, Dear, did you turn the stove off? And the reply comes back, I'm sure I did. After I got the coffee pot, I looked over, saw the red light on the stove, cranked it off, saw the red light go off. I am sure that stove is off. You continue driving. Everything's good. Answer number two. Honey, did you turn the stove off? Uh, I think I did. I don't know. You turn around and go back and turn the stove off because you just don't know. So you check. Answer number three. Honey, did you turn the stove off? I'm pretty sure I did. Yeah. No. You turn around even faster than you did for answer two. Because that answer really leaves a lot of doubt. Did you hear that? Did you catch that? There's doubt in that answer. That is what verse 12 is all about. Let me read that part again. Yet none of his disciples asked, dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. That answer is like answer number three. It's like, why did John even say that? That brings up the issue. That's like a signpost that says, dig here. There's a lot more here than just that simple phrase. That phrase is enormous. Why did John put that in there? Why did Mary think that he was the gardener when he had risen? Why when he appeared in the room before Thomas was there, they didn't recognize him then? How come when Thomas was there another time, he came in, they didn't recognize him again until he showed him the prince again? Why on the road to Emmaus for seven miles, they did not recognize Jesus? Over and over and over and over again, he appears, he appears to them, and they don't recognize him. <clears throat> Why? When they had spent three years with the man. Why? And now here with the fish, again, another appearance of Jesus, and they did not recognize him. You want to know why? And this is the huge heart of the matter. And, uh, 
as was touched on this morning in the service, and I'd already had it in my notes, but I'm going to touch on it again. It's because of what Isaiah said. If you look back, 52 verse 14 says, But just as many were astonished at you, so his visage was marred more than any man. He was not recognizable as even being human. You know when you run up, you see something in the road that's been dead, you can't tell if it's a cat or a dog or a possum because it has been so mangled, it's not recognizable? That's how bad Christ was. The beating he had took, he was not even recognizable. Do you know, I, don't, I can't can grip the, the amount of mangling that would take. The amount of swelling in the eyes. The amount of brokenness in the nose. The amount of swelling in the lips and bleeding um, broken of his face. The cauliflower ear from being punched around. Just, just the hugeness <coughs> of his deformities. And the, if you go back another couple chapters in, in Isaiah in, in chapter 50, verse 6, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. So they're pulling out his beard as well as doing everything else. After his face was so swollen from the horrible beating he took from the Jews, then, being swollen, they pressed on the crown of thorns. After he was resurrected, nearly every time he's showing them the prince as proof, as evidence of who he is, because he still bore the scars. And that's what bothers me a lot. Because of the mangling he took, it appears as though he still has that disfigurement. It seems as though that disfigurement is going to accompany him for the rest of eternity. That for me... He is going to bear that for all eternity. Is that incredible? Is that incredible? When you see him, you're, going to see, you're not going to recognize him. You see all these paintings and these pictures of what Jesus is supposed to look like? His own disciples who are with him intimately for three years did not even recognize him again and again and again and again because of the brutality that he had suffered. And he apparently still has all of that. All those scars. Our sins are washed in his blood again. Yep. yep. Again. If you go to Revelation yep. chapter 5, <clears throat> they're looking for someone to take the scroll and open the seven seals. And they're bothered by this in heaven because nobody's found worthy. Then all of a sudden, John's weeping and the angels say, John, don't worry, man, because the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to take the scroll, to open it up and loose the seven seals. And when John turned around, did he see the lion of the tribe of Judah? No, what did he see? A lamb as if it had been slain. And if you go back to Leviticus and read what they had to do to those lambs, it's horrible and it's brutal the way they had to separate the fat and separate the organs and do this and do that and, and cut this part up and cut that part up. That lamb is not recognizable as being a lamb either. And so when John turned around and saw Jesus, he still had the same mingling scars all over him and the disfigurement. For what? For me? Hardly worth it. Hardly. But he did it anyway. I, I, it, it, this, the, these are things that we just cannot wrap our head around, folks. That somewhere before the earth was even created, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit had predetermined all this. We're going to make them. They're going to rebel. We're going to send one of us down there. And the son says, I got that. And volunteered to go and become so disfigured for the rest of eternity on behalf of us. Forever. Forever. 
Wow. That is the depth of verse 12. Nobody dared ask him because they were sure it was the Lord. Honey, did you turn the stove off? Yeah. I'm sure. That's Jesus. You look at those scars. Brutal. Brutal for us. Verse 15. John 21, 15. So then, so when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And I'm going to stop right there for a second. There's been some debate. More than these what? More than the rest of the men that were there? John, uh, or Peter, do you love me more than those? Or the fish? The fish represented income. This was a great haul of fish. They probably could have got a lot of money. Peter, do you love me more than that? Now, the interesting thing was Jesus used the word agape, agapeo, which is the same word used in the verse that says that the men loved darkness more than they loved the light because of their sins were evil. They agape darkness with a perfect love. They loved darkness and their sin. It's the same word, agape. It's complete, unconditional, unreserved love. A love that's sacrificial. This is not the boyfriend, girlfriend, sappy love from junior high school. Will you be my boyfriend? Puppy love type. No, no, no. This is the kind of love that somebody will lay down their life for somebody else. Unconditional. This is the kind of love that's talked about in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 13, the love chapter. Love is this, love is that. Love does not embarrass, love is not rude. Uh, love bears all things, believes all things, love hopes all things. Not proud and not boastful. Yep, love, that kind of love doesn't fail. Well, how does he respond? The rest of verse 15. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. When he responded, he didn't say, yes, Lord, you know I, I agape you. He said, Lord, you know I, I phileo you. That's the word he used. It's I'm fond of. There's a difference in the phrase. Peter, do you love me, man? You know how I just hung on the cross for six hours, brutalized for you? Peter, do you unconditionally, unreservedly love me? Peter said, Lord, you know I'm fond of you. Wow. That's kind of touchy. Jesus said then, keep feeding my lambs, my little ones. Verse 16. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Let me read it properly. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me? Peter said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. I'm fond of you. He said to him, Then tend or shepherd my sheep. <clears throat> so the first one was, Feed my little ones, my little lammies. The second one, one is, Shepherd my sheep. Tend my adults. Okay, shepherd them. Again, verse 17, he says, He said to him a third time, Listen to this. Simon, son of Jonah, do you phileo me? Are you fond of me? Peter was grieved because he had said the third time, Do you phileo me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo you. I'm fond of you. Jesus said to him, Then feed my sheep. And the sheep there is of more matured, not just adult, but seasoned. So there's three different groups there Peter's being entrusted with. Peter, feed my little lammies. Peter, shepherd my adult sheep. Peter, feed and continue feeding my seasoned sheep. Okay. That's 
the little conversation that we're allowed to have a peek into that Jesus had with Peter. Three times, Peter denied Christ. Mm -hmm. Three times, Christ is calling him back, restoring him back to what he was, what he had left, what he had denied. And interestingly enough, Jesus is going back all the way to the beginning. He's not even calling him Peter. He's calling him Simon. He's not saying Cephas or Peter, Petros, small little movable stone. He's going back to the name he had before he was even a disciple. He's recalling him, refreshing him, refilling him with his Holy Spirit, calling him back, restoring him on the inside, getting him ready to go out and preach a message that's going to win 3,000 people to Jesus at once on the day of Pentecost. Verse 18 and 19. Jesus says, Most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you were old, you will stretch out your hands, and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, those words again, one more time, follow me. Isn't that just so perfect? It just, it's, 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 it could not have been, Hollywood could not have scripted a better script than that. Remember the first two words Jesus spoke to Peter as he's in the boat. Hey, follow me. Here it is again. Peter, you've gone backwards. You denied me. You had some issues. Well, I'm going to restore you. Come back. Follow me. Let's go. Forget the fish, Peter. I got bigger things for you. Bigger things. These fish are going to be nothing. But Peter, I need you on my side. I need to know for sure which do you love more. That, the wealth of this world, the opportunities it's going to give you, the public speaking engagements, the chance to be famous, or are you going to keep it simple, Peter? Just preach the gospel. Are you going to feed my sheep? Are you going to feed my little lambies? Are you going to keep disciplining and teaching my seasoned ones? Can I count on you, Peter? Follow me. But there's a bigger thing here. Peter's being told to take up his cross and follow Jesus. You know, incidentally, when John wrote this, Peter had already been dead for some more than 20 years. Peter had died in 67 AD. John didn't write this till decades later, after Patmos and Ephesus to answer the issues that were going on there. This had already happened. He's writing this from uh, like a historical, uh, giving a, a history of what's letting us peek into these conversations. John wrote this for a reason. He wrote all this so that we can then read it and hear this conversation and look at the Lord's forgiveness. Look at his restoration. Look at what he did for Peter. And what can he do for us? You think you've messed up? You think you've screwed up? You've sinned? I don't think any of us on the night Jesus was being tried stood outside warming ourselves. Denying that we even knew him. Even though we were just there minutes before with a sword in our hand cutting off a guard's ear. Peter messed up. He messed up big time. Mm -hmm. And the Lord was saying, Peter, I still got plans for you, buddy. Yeah. You might make a mess of your life, but I'm the unmess maker. I will take it. I am the steamroller that will flatten out every wrinkle. In fact, I will take those dirty, filthy garments of yours, Peter, and I'll give you white, clean, shining garments. Spot-free, wrinkle-free, Peter. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to charge you with responsibility now. I'm getting ready to leave, Peter. I can't do what you're going to do, but I'm going to work through you and with you and strengthen you, Peter. And you're going to do some phenomenal things, Peter. You need to be feeding my little lambies, Peter. You need to be tending my sheep, Peter. You need to be feeding my seasoned ones and keeping them ready so nobody falls away like you did. And you won't ever again, Peter. The same challenge goes out to us today. 
You know, when Jesus was raised from the dead, he was already on the other side of the cross. These guys weren't. That phrase, take up your cross and follow me, was now having new meaning in their lives. They knew how serious it was because they had just witnessed what happened to him. And now he's sitting there among them, disfigured still. And he's saying, hey, take up your cross and follow me. Let's end this the last few verses. Verse 20. Verse 20 says, Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at, su at the supper, and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, uh, But Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then this saying went out among the brethren, that this disciple would not die, Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if I will that he remain till I come. What's that to you? I don't think Jesus is being sarcastic. Let's finish this up. Verse 24. This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things. And we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the scrolls that would be written. Amen. And John finishes up just like that. In fact, I closed my Bible a fraction too soon. Because I want to go straight back to that other verse. So he, he said, I, I suppose the, the world cannot contain the scrolls that would be written. But these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Peter, you have a destiny that only you can fulfill. John, you've got a destiny only you can fulfill. We all can't be Peter's. We all can't be John's. We all can't be Barnabas, Nathaniel's. Thomas's, Andrew's. They all have their own ministry to fulfill. And they did. We have our own. And Jesus says, no, you might not be a Billy Graham, but you know what? You've got an important role. Who were the people behind the scenes praying for Paul while he was out? Can you name them? I can't. But I know that those people praying behind the scenes are going to get just the same reward as Paul got. Who were the people praying for Billy Graham behind the scenes? I don't know. I know the name Billy Graham. I know Paul, Peter. But do you know that there were people praying behind the scenes that they don't know about? You know, a, a friend was visiting church this morning. His name's Tony Freeman. He doesn't know who I am. But I walked to him and said, hey, give him a hug, Tony. Give his wife a hug, Lois. Hey, every morning when I get to pray, I mention you by name, brother. And I walked off. He doesn't need to know who I am. All he needs to know is that behind the scenes, because he's a missionary, there's people praying. That's my ministry. That's what I do. I'm not out front. I'm not the lead singer. I sit behind, quietly tapping on the drums. Because that's what I do. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do? What's your ministry? If you can't go to India and be a missionary on the fields, can you pray for the missionaries who are out there? You sure can. If you can't go to Pakistan or Syria or the Gaza Strip and be persecuted for being a Christian, can you at least pray for those who are being persecuted? Yeah. In fact, we're called to in the Bible. It says, remember those who are in chains as if it was you. That's a calling for all of us who are not in chains. We in the United States of America owe it. Owe it as a debt of love to those people who are persecuted mercilessly. Who themselves are getting the same scars that Jesus has. I don't know about you, but I don't have one single scar of Christ. 
That's kind of embarrassing, in a way. Am I going to be the only one strutting around heaven with nothing to show for my Christianity? I don't know. These guys, who there are people suffering all over the world for the cause of Christ. In fact, last statistic I heard was two-thirds of the body of Christ is in persecution. I'll give you a guess where that one-third is living who is not in persecution. <laughs> right here in these free countries. We owe it to them to pray for them, to do our ministry. Jesus told Peter, Peter, don't worry about John. You just do what I've called you to do and do it faithfully. Do it tenaciously, Peter. Run after it. Just like that wide receiver is running to go catch that ball because he knows that quarterback just slung it and it's going. And if I'm not at the right place at the right time, it's going to drop. I've got to haul blank down that field to get down there and catch that ball. And so that guy runs and runs and runs. And don't you know at the right time, boom, he catches that ball and scores a touchdown. Why? Because he knew his job and he ran and he did it well. And so we, the ball's in the air, folks. What are we going to do? Are we going to worry about, what, what's the defender doing? What's the blocker doing? What's he doing? What are those cheerleaders doing? What's the guy up in the crowd doing? What's the coach doing over there? Or, or, or we, with the ball in the air, just going to focus on the ministry we've got and run with everything we have. Run! Because we're the only one who can catch our ball. Nobody else can. Okay, you've got a ministry. It's time we take up our cross and follow Jesus. Forget about the things of this world. They're going to perish anyway. It's not worth focusing on. Peter, leave the fish. The Lord's saying the same thing to us. Leave the fish. Forget about these things. How much do we focus on career and climbing the corporate ladder, getting more out of this world, which is perishing? And we forget the important things of life. Mercy. Justice. Grace. Forgiveness. Restoring broken lives. That are going to matter in eternity. We have a calling. It's time we step up. Step up to that calling. And if you have nothing else to do, I would challenge you and give you this challenge. And, and seek the Lord about it. This is what he wants you to be doing. Pray for the persecuted Pray for the missionaries. If nothing else, pray for the persecuted. Pray for the missionaries. That the Lord would give them the strength, the grace, and the courage to stay true to Him. To not give up or give in as they are mercilessly persecuted. That the Lord would grant the missionaries the provision they need and the wisdom to use it. That they wouldn't squander the Lord's provision. That the Lord would grant them protection in the countries where they serve. That the Lord would grant them volunteers to come alongside them to help bring in the harvest. That the Lord would soften the hearts of those who are going to hear the gospel for the first time through these missionaries and their missions. Pray for the persecuted. Pray for the missionaries. And let's see what the Lord will do. Who knows? You may be responsible for bringing in a large haul because you got on your knees and prayed for them bless them. And they may not never know it until we get to heaven and cross over and we see the results of all these people start streaming into heaven because these missionaries were protected. Because we prayed, Lord, send your warring angels to surround them. Let the plans of the enemy fall to the ground like David prayed in the book of Psalms. Like broken arrows and broken bows, Lord. Let his, let his, let his teeth fall out. Let his arms be broken. You know, I, I, we, can't, we don't pray that against people. But the way David prayed against his enemies in the Psalms, I think we need to be praying against our enemy. Satan, the devil, who comes to attack us. If you want to know how to pray against him, that's what I would do. What did David say? Lord, <laughs> let his weapons fall to the ground as useless. But protect the missionaries. Send your warring angels and surround them and keep them, Lord. Let their words flow like water from the mouths. And let the ears of these people be opened up and hear. That many would come to you today, Jesus. I think that's a good place to end it. John said, hey, I wrote this to you for a reason. I wrote it to clear the air so that you can hear these things and don't be doubting anymore, but be believing. So Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote 
and people still had doubts. And he said, John, you got to help fill in the blanks, man. And he did. And he did present Christ like Matthew did. Matthew presented him as the Messiah. Mark presented him as a servant. Luke presented him as a man. John presented him as God. That's the big difference. God the Son, who stepped out of eternity into my time zone. So, Ron, I've got something for you that's going to just blow your mind. You've sinned against me, son. You can't come into my kingdom like you are. Nothing you can do can get you here. But you know what? i got a plan. And even if you were the only person, Ron, I'd still do it for you. So don't be unbelieving. Be believing. Take up your cross and follow me. And let's do this. Stay tuned. Next week we're going to be in Luke chapter 1. See ya.